Right, good morning everybody. Let's get started <clears throat> and welcome to our first webinar of 2021. Uh, today we're going to, this is a joint webinar between Erome and Per Anderson who we'll introduce shortly. Uh, you can see Hannah there on video, we'll introduce her in a second. Um, so today we're talking uh, staycations, how travel companies can ride the domestic travel boom. As you all know, um, international travel has been pretty much uh, decimated by the coronavirus but in many countries domestic travel is is booming in fact it's doing better than it was before the pandemic so we're going to be talking about that today uh, and about how companies adapt to it um just a little bit of housekeeping before we start we're probably going to take about 30 35 minutes today we'll have time for questions at the end in your zoom window towards the bottom you'll see a little box mark q a so if you've got a question at any time just type it in there and we'll either answer it there and then or we'll save it till the end whatever's appropriate there's also a chat window as well um, so if at any point you have technical problems you can't hear me or you can't see my screen then please just uh, type something in the chat window uh, to let us know and finally both hannah and i are working from home at the moment i've got three very noisy dogs and i believe hannah's got a toddler at home with her so if you if you hear any noise in the background uh, <laughs> you know then you know what it is and we apologize in advance just Right, let's introduce our uh, speakers today. I'm Tim Russell. I'm commercial director for Southeast Asia for eRome, and I also look after all the companies' marketing, digital marketing, uh, website, PR, and so on. And joining me today, our guest speaker is Hannah Pearson of Pear Anderson. Good morning, Hannah. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yes, good, thank you. How's the weather in, in uh, Malaysia? It's cold here in Thailand. Thank nice. God. No, warm, maybe 28, 28 nice. degrees. 19 yeah. degrees here in Bangkok. That's nice. It's, uh, <laughs> it's unusually cold. Usually cold, so it's quite nice for a change. Definitely. Um, so thanks for joining us, Hannah. I believe you're doing another, another webinar this afternoon. So a uh, busy, <laughs> busy day for you. You can tell us about I've, that. Yeah, exactly. I've got to squeeze it in because tomorrow Malaysia is going into lockdown. So. Oops. Okay. Well, <laughs> Tomorrow, you can tell us about your second webinar later. Maybe some of us will. Exactly. I've registered already, actually. Maybe you can get some more people to register <laughs> from, from this event. Good. Right, let's, let's quickly run through what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to first of all, or, or we're going to talk about the numbers, about how COVID-19 travel restrictions have boosted domestic tourism. Um, we're going to talk about adaptation, about how companies can change their approach to benefit from the domestic travel boom. Uh, we're going to look at some examples of companies that are that are doing it right some good examples of, of companies promoting domestic travel and then we'll finish with a quick q a if anybody uh, has any questions that's the that's the format uh, we're going to start by looking at the, the numbers and i'm going to hand over to hannah here because i think the first three slides you put together hannah with your with your stats yeah. and weekly report so so just just talk us through these these numbers here sure i mean the first slide here these are the January to October 2020 numbers um, and the reason why it's only up to October is because only one country, Vietnam, has released all the way till the end of the year. Um, but needless to say, it's what you can imagine. You know, these are international arrivals into uh, these countries, into Southeast Asia. And you can see across the board, everyone has done terribly. Uh, I mean, Singapore has probably done the worst out of everybody so far, but that's because they were also affected the first, um, if you remember. Um, Thailand minus 79.5 percent minus 72.35 percent for Indonesia it's massive basically um, there's pretty much no no travel inbound happening right now it's been a, it's been a disaster here in Thailand I mean yeah. just walking around tourist areas in, in Bangkok and seeing how many businesses have, have closed down and shut down it's, it's really really sad right. it's yeah it's yeah. been it's been catastrophic for us uh, for us here definitely um, and this probably this is something that I update this, this table on a weekly basis, and you can get an idea from here exactly what kind of opportunities there are, i.e., extremely limited. Um, so there's only three countries right now that I would consider are open. There are not very many restrictions at all. So Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, um, and those three countries have also managed to keep their case numbers relatively low. Um, yeah. Everyone else is on a kind of partial 
lockdown and I define that by maybe schools being closed or workplaces being closed or limitations on the, the gathering of people you know in Singapore they can still only gather eight people together so it's still seriously limited although schools are open and workplaces are now open um, in terms of inbound travel nearly everybody is restricted I've put Thailand there as, as a green in that they're kind of open but you've got well, visa free access anyhow to 56 countries, but you've still got this two week quarantine to deal with. So you're kind of open, but you're kind of not open. Yeah, I um, don't think tourists are going to come here when they've, they've got to spend 14 nights in a, a hotel at their own expense. Um, exactly. So it's, uh, I know a few people have done quarantine, but there are people who live here and, and were overseas and have had to come back. Yeah. Um, but for, for tourists to come here, unless you can do a quarantine in a nice beach resort for two weeks. I mean, yeah, that, that, yeah that, exactly. Uh, that might be attractive, but I still don't think it's uh, going to help the tourism yeah. industry. I agreed. And in terms of outbound travel, um, only two countries right now are really permitted to do that and, and go anywhere they want, Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, but both right now are having to quarantine on return home as well. So again, that's going to severely limit the number of outbound travelers because it's the same thing. You don't want to go on holiday and then have to go quarantine for two weeks when you come back. Um, so it's, it's a pretty grim situation in terms of if you're an inbound travel agency, if you're an outbound travel agency, there's not much to be done. Um, if we look at domestic travel, um, even domestic travel across Southeast Asia, it's not entirely open everywhere. Um, so Malaysia, I mean, they, they just announced, like I said, um, yesterday we're going back into lockdown, tomorrow quite a strict lockdown, so domestic travel is pretty much uh, up against the wall there. Myanmar is still restricted. Philippines is still never fully reopened. Um, at least Malaysia and Myanmar had reopened fully at one point and then closed back in about September, October. But Philippines is still very, very limited in terms of the amount of domestic travel you can do, where you can go to. And often you're going to need an antigen test just to travel domestically or an RT-PCR test, which again is a massive disincentive for travel just because it's less convenient, uh, it's very costly, you know, it's that hassle factor. And of course, Thailand now as well from last week as well, now uh, restricting interprovincial travel for certain provinces. Um, so we, we were getting better, I suppose, and at the beginning of 2021, it seems like things are going backwards, but um, domestic travel is the only opportunity. This is where the green squares are. It's not an inbound travel, it's not an outbound travel, it's domestic. And that's why uh, Tim and I wanted to talk about domestic travel today, because that's where we really believe that the opportunities are going to lie for the majority of 2021. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we've got this last, th this next slide here as well, which is a survey done by uh, OAG back in, I think it was October, November last year, uh, about traveler intention to fly in the next six months. And you can see that globally, um, there's a lot of intent there. And most of the intent is domestic. 79% of people say they want to fly domestically uh, within the next six months. 69% internationally is probably a little bit optimistic, but um, those, those domestic uh, travel figures probably certainly more a lot more realistic so that's good news for those people who sell domestic travel is that the intent is there and um, particularly here in APAC you see there's a big difference between international and uh, and domestic there so again I think that's something that travel companies travel agents DMCs hotels should be focusing on certainly for the first first two quarters uh, yeah. of this year um, we've got some some more stats on, on recovery here from a recent survey by McKinsey uh, we can see in this first one on the left that domestic they, they forecast that domestic tourism is expected to recover maybe one to two years earlier than outbound um, they see domestic travel getting back to the 2019 level which is this, this 100 mark here on the left sometime in 2022 whereas outbound might take another year or two beyond that uh, to recover uh, we think they think this year that domestic travel will probably back to around 75 80 percent what it was in 2019 um, and just let me move Hannah's face out of the way there. Um, uh, domestic tourism is already outperforming hotels and airlines. Uh, we can see for 2021 forecasts at 80%, whereas hotels and airlines are probably going to be below 50% of what they were in, in 2019. So good news for the for the domestic travel sector there. Would you would you agree with those predictions, Hannah? Do you think that's pretty realistic? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody 
pretty much right now is thinking that domestic is going to outperform inbound or outbound right now. I mean, it's, it's kind of a logical sense as well. People are going to feel more comfortable traveling around in their own in their own country. I mean, we've even seen in countries like Vietnam, where the domestic flights are almost reaching back to those 2019 levels uh, that they were at before. Um, so there is that appetite for travel. It's just, of course, getting that consumer confidence up. Um, to well, be we, we saw it in Thailand as soon as domestic travel reopened in June. I mean, the beaches were all were all full. There was a public holiday where they were turning people away from beaches in, in Bang Sen uh, near Bangkok. So the, the demand is, is definitely there. And, um, just uh, trying to exploit yeah. it is the uh, is the question. Here's what's happened in China exactly. again. This is, uh, this, this is what happened in China 2020 versus 2019. Um, this was up till September last year. We can see that in September, hotel room nights actually outperformed 2019 mm. um, for, for domestic travel. Um, we can see that subway passengers were approaching to 2019 figures, as were domestic flights. Railways a little bit slower. Um, obviously, international flights cruise passengers virtually non-existent. Um, but Thailand, which uh, sorry, China, which is where the first cases of the virus appeared, where the virus really began, is seeing um, seeing an increase in, in anything in, in domestic travel. People can't travel abroad, so they're discovering their own country, and that's a pattern that we've seen all over the region and uh, and globally. I think is it the same in Malaysia, uh, Hannah? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely domestic tourism is increasing. And I think across Southeast Asia, um, we've got a lot of countries like Indonesia and like Vietnam with big populations. Um, and they don't necessarily have to rely on so much on inbound tourism because they have such a massive population like China to be able to support that kind of domestic tourism growth. It's countries like Singapore that will struggle. <laughs> yeah, Singapore and, and other smaller countries like Cambodia and, and Laos definitely as well. Laos. Mm -hmm countries as well people can't necessarily afford to to travel domestically exactly okay so we've looked at the the numbers which which don't make good reading for international travel but do make good reading for domestic travel so in this next section we're going to talk uh, adaptation and we're going to talk about how uh, companies who maybe aren't used to selling domestic travel uh, can adapt to this boom and, and ride it and maybe um, make a little bit of money during these lean times um, so I think the, the the first thing, I know Hannah and I discussed this already a couple of weeks ago when we first set this up, and it's strategic partnerships. And I think there's a difference in travel agents and DMCs and that travel agents have got big databases of domestic customers. They don't always have a lot of knowledge or expertise of their own country, of, of their own domestic destinations, whereas DMCs, on the other hand, have got that in-depth local knowledge. They're used to dealing with inbound tourists selling their own destination, but they don't really have the experience uh, of selling to local tourists. I, I met it with a, a big DMC here late last year and we talked about this topic and he said they tried selling domestic trips um, but they'd got no experience of it. They'd got no database of local travelers. They'd got no real experience of what domestic travelers want. They're more used to selling to international tourists so they've not really been very successful about it. But I think there's a scope here for partnership here for, for DMCs and tour operators to get together with travel agents and benefit from each other's knowledge and, and contacts. Would you agree with that, Hannah? Yeah, definitely. And I think you make a really good point there about DMCs being used to handling inbound tourists, because I do think a lot of domestic, well, a, lot, a lot of tourism in general within the countries is geared towards inbound rather than domestic. So I think everybody is actually having to do a, a big think and try and figure out what exactly it is that domestic tourists want um, from yeah. domestic tourism. Yes, it's, a, it's going to be a, see a, need a big change in, in thinking for a lot of companies. Yeah. Uh, and I think companies need to get a bit more creative in their offering. I mean, the first example I've got here is promoting lesser known destinations, including ones that foreign tourists love, but locals are maybe not so familiar with. Um, some of you might know Muine in Vietnam on the coast, about three hours north of Saigon. It's always been very popular with um, foreign tourists, but not so much with with local tourists so it's about thinking a little, little bit creatively and coming up with um with destinations that that locals domestic tourists might not might not know about yeah exactly and i think once you start to get that when inbound starts to pick up it's going to they, they're going to flow into one another as well you know as you become more creative with your domestic offerings you can then offer that to inbound tourists and it 
it becomes more exciting for them too. So it, it's kind of a win-win situation, I think. Yeah, exactly. And think about what you can offer that domestic tourists might struggle to arrange themselves. We often think that domestic tourism is more of a DIY thing, that people can arrange it themselves and jump in their cars and drive off to a hotel or whatever. But there are, there are still things that um, domestic tourists might not be able to arrange themselves and, and being able to provide, provide them with a, a guide, for example, um, I think is, uh, is also quite important. And I think putting together programs, we mentioned, we just mentioned this really, put, uh, putting together programs based on domestic rather than foreign traveller interests. I think this is where the DMC I spoke to last year fell down. They're so used to putting together itineraries for foreign tourists that, you know, what they were putting together didn't have much appeal um, for inbound tourists. So there's no point really, uh, sorry for domestic tourists, there's not a lot of point selling a tour of Bangkok, taking in the, the Grand Palace and Wat Po and everything to domestic travellers, because they've all been there, they all know. Um, it's it's a, it's about putting together something a little bit more creative to appeal to domestic travellers. And I think you've got some examples of this later in the webinar, haven't you, Anna? Exactly, exactly. And I'd add also in terms of food, you know, that's a whole other thing as well, isn't it? You know, what international inbound tourists want in terms of food is going to be very, very different to what domestic tourists want as well. So there's a rethink about that. And of course, food is so important for Southeast Asian travellers in general. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I did a I did a tuk tuk tour of Bangkok a few years ago, and one of the stops on there was at a famous uh, pad thai restaurant. Which foreign tourists love pad thai. Whereas for Thais, there's nothing special about going to a pad thai restaurant. It's something they can eat on the street near their house for for twenty or thirty baht. So that's an example of you know yeah. why you have to rethink some of the things that you include in your tours. Yeah, exactly. And I think if you're a DMC, thinking about the services you offer and thinking about other sectors that might be interested in, in them is also one strategy. I, I spoke to a, a, a friend of mine who runs a DMC in Laos the weekend, and this year they're switching and focusing on team building uh, and corporate retreats and things for, for local businesses because they accept there's going to be no inbound tourism for at least the first couple of quarters. Um, so they're, target, they're targeting things like team building events, company events. Yeah. And of course, these are the kind of things that perhaps might have been taken abroad before and are now not, right? You're now pretty much constrained or the companies are too afraid to take that liability of, of taking their employees overseas. So there is, although budgets, I think, will be a bit limited this year, there is still potential, definitely, to I think budgets that. will be limited, but also the hotel rates will be a lot lower than they've, they've been previously. Um, again, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but you know, some of the four and five star hotel rates we're seeing here in Bangkok at the moment are unbelievable. Um, so corporate retreats and team building, yes, they may not have so much of a budget for it, but they may not need it because they're, they're probably, you know, a third to maybe half the price that they would have been last yeah. year. Sorry, yeah. not last year, the year before. I keep forgetting we're in 2021 now. I think it's 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking about trends in domestic travel as well is, is important, looking at trends. And uh, a really good source of that here in Thailand, at least, is Instagram. Thais are, uh, are passionate Instagrammers, obsessive Instagrammers. Monitoring trending destinations or, or travel trends uh, on Instagram is a really, really good way to see what domestic travelers want. For example, it sounds unusual, but fog, hashtag fog was trending in Thailand over the holiday period. We don't really, we don't really see fog in Thailand. It's, it's pretty rare. But there was a lot of fog in the mountains in the north of Thailand around places like Chiang Rai and um, Mae Hong Son and Chiang Mai, places like that. And people were actually flying out of Bangkok to go, and, to go up mountains and, and see fog. There were, there, were, there were photographs of fog all over Instagram. Yeah. Which, it was a bit unusual. And then the Thai person explained to me that fog is so rare here that it's a, a, a kind of a unique natural phenomenon and people were traveling to see it. Mm, um, that's interesting. But yeah, so fog tours is one uh, one trend to jump on. Yeah. What, what, what domestic trends have you seen in, in Malaysia or, or elsewhere, Hannah? Um, oh, in Malaysia, I think it's just pe people going off, going, going to like the rice paddies, going out to the countryside, uh, always like the colourful buildings. If someone's built a colourful restaurant next to a, a beautiful nature spot, those always tend to trend here as well. Um, yeah. So, well, here, yeah. Anything people can put on Instagram tends to tend to trend and I think like you said back to nature has been a bit of a trend here as well um we we know a little farm stay place in Pechaburi that we've stayed at before and talking to the owner he said he's full every weekend and it's all ties there's no, no foreigners there it's, it's all ties going staying at his farm stay which is in the middle of all these rice paddies and they have to collect their own food and cook their own food and things and um, it's something that we're that's another trend that we're seeing here 
Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, to, to lead into our last point here, so it's once you've discovered what these kind of hot trends are, it's then how do you translate that, but to a lesser known destination? So I guess you can be like the next big thing and you can introduce it because of course people are looking to avoid big crowds now. So it, if you can find that lesser traveled version of fog or <laughs> nature or whatever it is and start promoting that. Yeah. And that's going to uh, and one trend we're we're seeing in in Bangkok is kind of an, is Instagram worthy resorts and coffee shops. People are, are deliberately building places that will appeal to Instagrammers. Like someone in Bangkok um, in the new year, open, they open. They literally took a Boeing seven four seven and turned it into a, ca a coffee shop yeah. <laughs> just outside. But it's near Suvarnabhumi Airport, so it's it's convert, converted seven four seven. And you go inside, you pay to get in. They give you a boarding pass. You go up the stairs. And then and inside it's a coffee shop and, and restaurant. And we had to queue for an hour to get in when we went there in, on, in the new year, the day it opened, because there were just hundreds <laughs> of people there going to get in. So, uh, so okay. in, Instagram is a really big um, indicator of, of travel trends. And also looking at influencers, finding out who the travel influencers are in your country, looking at where they're traveling. Because if someone who's a, an influencer with thousands and thousands of followers goes somewhere, everyone's going to follow them, whether it's a restaurant, a hotel, a destination or whatever. So, you know, look at where influence is going. Yep, definitely. So trends, very important. And um, thinking about timeliness as well, and we've got a, this first point, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a couple of images that illustrate this later, but um, stress the advantages of traveling now without any foreign tour groups making destinations busy. I, I was walking around near the Grand Palace and Wat Po in Bangkok, uh, last week and it was empty it was deserted normally it'd be full of tour buses and chinese tour groups and it would be packed it's empty now so it's a great time for people to visit yep. absolutely you're seeing the same in um malaysia i guess as well yeah 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 definitely yeah it's 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 you know you go to see the patronus towers hardly any queue so it's uh, it's the time you're right yeah, it's great. There's, 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 there's no cues. You can actually get in and, and um, promoting weekend staycations in your own city as well, because hotel deals are super cheap. At the moment. I did a staycation at the, uh, the Conrad in Bangkok just before Christmas, where you'd normally pay, I don't know, it's normally about three or four hundred dollars for a room. I got a room with buffet breakfast for two people for sixty dollars um, and they upgraded me as well. And there's loads and loads of similar deals. Around. Yeah. And I think you did you did similar, didn't you, around around Christmas? Yeah, around yeah, around Christmas. Stayed at the Mandarin Oriental, really cheap room for a suite overlooking uh, the KLCC, like the Golden Triangle in, in Malaysia. So there are really cheap deals. And I think, you know, if you're a tour operator or a travel agent and you're looking to promote these hotels, I think, but you need to also think of some value adds. I think, you know, it it makes it easier to be able to compete not just on price because of course yes you're going to show the cheap price but perhaps they could book directly with the hotel for the cheap price so you sure. need to be looking for something a little extra something special for your yeah friends. like a spa voucher or a dinner voucher or yeah. something like that yeah and that's the advantage i think of doing a staycation in your own city it's not just the room because you've got a bed in your own house but it's having these little inclusions like you know a nice breakfast or a a dinner or a spa session or having access to a pool a nice pool and gym for for the afternoon as well uh, I think you mentioned this last one, didn't you? Promoting weekday travel yeah. to, to retirees and so on. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we've seen so, like you said, every weekend a lot of places are packed. But of course, everybody knows that uh, off peak travel, you, weekdays, that's still really struggling. So you, it's great to have really high occupancies over the weekends, but what do you do during the week? Um, and normally it would be international travelers or business travelers that are filling those kind of gaps but right now you don't have that um so one idea is to then start thinking about well who has the time i mean working professionals are still working but who has time well retirees maybe other non-working travelers have that more flexibility um, so it's then creating special offers which can be driven by price or again value adds but to incentivize them that instead of going on the weekends travel during the weekday as well and, and make also, it a little Digital nomads and remote workers as yeah. well, people who aren't tied to the office or tied yep. to, to home, you know, to encourage people to go off and take their laptop and work by the beach for a week or something like that. Yeah, so. yeah, no, that's great because I think so, so many people now have that flexibility as well. Like they're not necessarily expected to be in the office and are just looking for somewhere different to, to set up their laptop with yeah. a nice view. <laughs> we mentioned the lack of foreign tour routes before, just to illustrate that. This is Angkor Wat 
uh, before the pandemic. <laughs> this is morning, morning in, in Angkor Wat. People want to photograph the, the sunrise. So you can see there's thousands of tourists there and, and all groups. And this is Angkor Wat now. Mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic. So if you're able to travel to Angkor Wat, now is the time to go because it's absolutely deserted. So you can get all those nice photos of, of the temple without crowds of, uh, of tourists on them. And there, and there are you know, there are scores of tourist attractions all across the world that look like this right now. We go yeah. to the Grand Palace, Bangkok yeah. now, or Wat Po. I'm sure it's like that. I said it's the same with the Patronus Towers in KL. Yeah. Um, and, you know, places here in Thailand such as you know places like Chiang Mai and so are pretty empty as well so uh, if you can now is a great time to discover your own country without being jostled by foreign yeah. tourists and, uh, and having to queue up. Absolutely. And I think one final point in terms of adapting uh, is embracing technology one of the best ways to reach domestic travelers of course is, is via digital marketing via via Facebook groups, Facebook pages. We mentioned Instagram before, using hashtags, looking at influencer partnerships uh, and so on. Um, using Google AdWords to, to target domestic travelers rather than, rather than foreign travelers. Um, yeah, any other ideas on, on that, Hannah, on how to reach domestic travelers digitally? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, email marketing or even, um, we talked about partnerships earlier between travel agents and tour operators, but it could be travel agents, uh, partnership sorry with other e-commerce providers even who have that big database of customers um, and creating a special offer just for them so that you can kind of tap into their database um, without necessarily big cost of having to build up that email database yourself especially if you're starting from relatively uh, little numbers if you're if you're new to the domestic market i think that it's good to strike partnerships like that exactly and I think also using technology that makes it easy for you to sell domestic products. Travel agents, you know, have got access to lots of international products. And I think using software that enables you just to access a large database of domestic accommodation providers, flights, tickets, our rental insurance, etc. I think is, is really important as well, you know, because obviously it takes a long time to build up these partnerships and you haven't got time at the moment. You need to, to move pretty quickly to jump on this. Yeah. This trend and technology is a, is a good way to do that. Obviously, we, we would say that as a technology company. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, but it, it been, is. <laughs> it is. It's a very quick way just to, to to access lots of domestic products and sell it easily. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that's a few ways that companies can uh, adapt. We're going to look at uh, Hannah's put together a few case that not, well, not really case studies, but examples of of companies course, that are yeah. that are doing it right. That are you know, some good examples of domestic promotions. So uh, Hannah, tell us about uh, tell us about these. Now, I saw that we had a question from Selena O, oh, and she'd asked, as a tiny country, Singapore, perhaps more than our larger neighbours, has had to reinvent itself very creatively uh, to address the domestic market. Any comments? Well, Selena, actually, a lot of these examples I'm going to show uh, are actually from Singapore. And, and I've kind of chosen them specifically because Singapore has really had that challenge. They've had such a limited domestic market that to be able to, you know, attract Singaporean customers, they have had to think outside of the box and they have had to think more creatively. Um, so these are a few examples. So the first one, this is from Malaysia. Um, and I really loved this idea. I thought it was really cool. And I'm kind of gutted that I didn't find it earlier as I would have booked it um, <laughs> myself, which is an airport staycation. Um, and you think, what's the point staying at an airport? You're not flying anywhere. Uh, well, the cool thing that they, flew, they, they threw into this is at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Um, so you stay at the airport hotel, but you can then also go and visit um, the fire station. Um, on the airport side and you can learn about what they do and if you've got kids they can meet the fire and you know they can meet the, the firemen you can have that they, they even call them pin-up firemen which I also mm. which I loved um, but it was you know a really kind of immersive experience you've got to do something completely different you'd never have that opportunity to do that um, normally um, so I thought that was, that was a really neat idea and they actually ran it a couple of times I think because it was so successful and because it was selling out um, second example is also from a hotel um, and this is from Singapore um, so this was the Millennium Hotels Group and they actually paired up with the Wildlife Reserve Singapore um, and they did two things so one was a kind of staycation experience um, and you got to stay in the hotel but you also then had a behind the tour behind the scenes tour of 
um, you know, Singapore's wildlife attractions. Um, so this is a particular example, you get to meet the pandas, get to meet the, the, the zookeepers who are looking after the pandas, ask them all sorts of questions. So again, it's like that value add. So maybe you've stayed in the Millennium Hotel before, maybe you have visited, um, you know, Singapore wildlife attraction before, but you combine them both and it makes it into something a bit special. Um, third example here is from Philippines. Um, and I was mentioning earlier for Philippines for domestic tourism, they have this restraint that you normally will need uh, an antigen test to be able to travel um, into provincially, or maybe you need an RT-PCR test. Um, so the microtel in Baguio actually had a, an offer that said, we will cover your antigen test for you. So kind of removing that disincentive um, to travel. Really, and that's a really good idea, yeah. Well, that was really neat. Um, you could do that with uh, vaccinations, couldn't you? You could have a hotel as uh, a vaccination, vaccination <laughs> staycation. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that that's going to come. Vaccination. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's that's a that's one good idea we've we've created from this, uh, this <laughs> yeah. webinar. Back to patients. I don't know. Get talking to your hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've got more you've examples. got more for us here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So next example. This is from a Myanmar tour operator, um, Sampan, um, and they. This is not actually so much targeting their domestic travellers as more keeping their international tourists um, engaged. Um, which I thought was also neat. Um, so they had a virtual um, tour, so they had a historian um, take uh, the viewers around um, World War II um, significant sites and giving the, the meaning behind them, and they did that as a series of tours over a, a few days, which I also thought was a really interesting way of, you know, keeping people abroad engaged too, because you don't want to forget about those customers. They are going to come back, hopefully. Yeah, that's a really good idea, actually, doing virtual <laughs> so, I mean, it takes a little bit, and I know virtual, you've got the added technology overhead. But I think if you can find an interesting twist to it, then it can be worthwhile doing it. Um, another example from Singapore. So this was uh, an innovative partnership. You know, I was just talking about doing partnerships with different people, not in the tourism industry. Um, so this was St. Regis, Singapore, and they, timed, they, they teamed up with Style Theory. Um, and Style Theory, um, they do something like rent a wardrobe, um, that kind of designer wardrobes. Um, so you, you could arrive into St. Regis Hotel and you would have a wardrobe waiting there um, full of full of clothes for you to wear. So it was a nice match of the kind of this luxury brand, luxury designers and, and luxury hotels together. Again, a neat, innovative experience. Um, and the last one that I wanted to share with you, again from Singapore, so you can see Selena, a lot of Singapore in here. Singapore's um, been very creative. Yeah, they have been. And like I said, because they have been so constrained, they have had to. Um, and this is from Trafalgar. Um, so, of course, you know, Singaporeans in well, Singaporeans who book Trafalgar normally book them to go to Europe or they book them to go to North America. Um, they don't normally book them to go to Singapore. Um, so what Trafalgar had to do is create, they, they created some really niche experiential tours. So this is, a, I think it was a two day, one night tour. Um, and they had you know, things like you got to meet Singapore's food ambassador and have a dining experience with them. Um, they arranged that you could climb up this clock tower, this heritage clock tower that no one else has access to. And those are the kind of things that I think uh, domestic, well, tour operators should be looking at creating um, because domestic travelers can't book that on them by themselves. Yes, they can book a uh, hotel um, by themselves. They could go book a tour guide perhaps by themselves but if you really want to create something special um you can and i think there are plenty of opportunities to be creative and play around with that um, yeah i think getting that unique insider said. access to places that aren't normally open um yeah. is a is a big draw as well yeah exactly it's kind of see you know this might be a building that you've walked past a million times but this time you actually get to see inside and see it from a different view and that's always kind of interesting you know in in london um I don't know if you ever did it, Tim, but they had, I think, one day, yeah, I can't remember what it's called, but where you can go and visit inside buildings, really iconic yeah, buildings, yeah. never normally allowed inside. Is it open um, house? These, open house is Yeah, called, something like that, yeah. Um, and that's always super popular. You know, you can book on, you can go up these skyscrapers that you've always seen in the City of London, or you can go behind the, the scenes in heritage museums and things. 
that's always super popular. So taking that concept and, and translating it for domestic tourists, I, I think definitely has some legs. We've also seen, uh, I think it was in, was it Singapore Airlines who did like just a, a, a one hour flight as well? You can get on a plane if you're missing flying and just fly around for a bit. And uh, they didn't do that. They didn't do the no, sightseeing Qantas, flight, Qantas but they, did, I think. yeah, they, they did other things. So they did like, you could have the meals delivered to you or you could go and sit on the, you don't go, the plane doesn't go up in the air, but you could go and sit on the plane and have a meal. <laughs> I, I think airline food is not one of the things that I'm... <laughs> But, uh, no, not that I miss. I, I miss flying, but I'm, I'm not not to the point where I want to eat airline food in my house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the, there's some really creative um, things out there. Um, it's just finding that that twist. And actually, I, I was reading. Uh, I, I didn't put a slide up for this one because I just found out about it. Uh, the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Kuala Lumpur have actually launched like uh, I think it's called Grand Flight Experience so it's a dining experience but they've actually set up the outside to look like you're walking through uh, KL International Airport you know with like, all the signs and things I think okay. they have like a check-in um, and then you sit and the, all, all of the different meals are themed you know from different countries and you're the flying so it's it's again like a very experiential um, idea of course these are you know these are more luxury but yeah. there are there are cheaper things I'm sure that you can find. That well, someone told me they were listening to there are YouTube videos of the noise of planes, like you can just listen to the noise of being on a plane. So someone told me they were listening to that to help them sleep the other day. That's interesting. And have the sound of it being on a plane. So yeah, there's there's Baby's plenty of wailing. ways you can there's plenty of yeah, plenty of ways you can recreate the flight experience in in your home, should you wish. Yes. Good. Some good ideas there, Hannah. Thanks for thanks for sharing those. Um, before we uh, we finish, we're going to talk a little bit about. I'm going to introduce you briefly to who we are at eRome, and Hannah will talk a little bit about about her company. Then we'll do a Q and A. If you've got any questions, think about those now and, and type them into the the Q and A window. Um, rather than me talk about eRome for ages, I'm just going to share you a very quick two minute video, which which shows you uh, basically what eRome is all about and what eRome can do. on YouTube, hurry up. Meet Jack and Jill. They have an appointment to visit their travel advisor today. They plan to book their round the world dream holiday. Jack explains his priorities are snorkeling and diving in Africa, Australia, and Thailand. Jill's priorities are visiting the hill tribes, shopping on Rodeo Drive, and taking the train across the Rocky Mountains. The advisor prepares and shows the proposed itinerary to Jack and Jill, which they agree to buy and get handed their tickets. Now, Jack and Jill are ready to go on their holiday. They can go to the airport and all the work is done. Right? Wrong. Let's take a look behind the scenes at what really happens and all the travel professionals involved in making a booking like this. First, the travel advisor conducts a consultation with the clients on where they want to travel and their requirements. From this information, the advisor checks availability and creates an itinerary with flights, hotels, and activities. This can take hours as they review from the millions of hotels, motels, guest houses, and hostels that are showing in the marketplace, and then working out what is best suited to Jack and Jill. With eRoam, the travel advisor can find, in minutes, curated content displaying the best hotels for your clients. Next, the advisor looks at the availability of over a thousand airline, train, and bus operators to see which offer the best deal based on Jack and Jill's requirements. Finally, the advisor needs to add from the curated content the best tour operators, DMCs, and wholesalers, like snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef, cruising down the Mekong River to Luang Prabang, or a first-class suite on the famous Rocky Mountaineer train. This can take suppliers several hours and, in most cases, days to respond to the advisor. With eRoam, this can be done in minutes. Once the advisor has all this information, they can then create a quote and proposed itinerary. This step normally takes a further two or more hours, but eRoam does this instantly. The eRoam Travel Operations Project is a partnership of eRoam Technologies and Travel Operations, powered by Microsoft Dynamics. If you would like to learn more, please contact our team. Thank you. Okay, so that's really a quick uh, introduction to, to eRoam. We've got millions of products and over 100,000 destinations, including over a million, uh, a million hotels and other accommodation types. Uh, we enable fast quoting 
booking uh, and changes. If you're a DMC, we can integrate with your back end solution uh, to enable you to have a, a nice front end to speed up quoting time and enable travel agents to do self serve login and quoting. We've got API integrations with hundreds uh, of travel providers. Uh, we can provide a white label B2C and B2C front end. And we're just about to launch Journey, which is our mobile app. So you can issue itineraries uh, in mobile format as well. So that's just a little bit about eRoam. You can find out more at eRoam.com or by contacting me uh, after this event. And uh, Hannah, you're going to tell us a little bit about your company, Per Anderson. Yeah, I mean, I won't tell you too much about what Per Anderson do. I mean, essentially, we do consulting about tourism industry within Southeast Asia and also the Muslim um, tourism industry. Um, but I did want to share with you a, a really useful tool, at least I think it is pretty useful, um, which is a, a COVID-19 dashboard that we've developed. Um, so this focuses on Southeast Asia. Um, we cover nine different countries. And there's all sorts of updates there from politics, the economy, to vaccines, to what's going on with inbound travel, outbound travel, um, aviation. Um, and I also pull all of that together into a weekly report that Tim was talking about earlier, which I send out every Sunday evening. Um, and that's um, almost 200 pages, I think, of different updates of what's happening um, in the region. So you can really um, try to uncover new opportunities, new business opportunities um, that you might not have thought about. Um, That's before. really made your company famous as well, hasn't it? This, this, uh, <laughs> I don't know about famous. Everyone in travel in Asia has heard of Per Anderson now because of your COVID dashboard, but it's been a really good initiative. Thank you, thanks. So yeah, I mean, click on over and if you're interested, there's a link on the, the website there on that link to, uh, to sign up for the for the uh, weekly report too or just find me on linkedin and ask me to send you the report no worries and i can do that too thanks hannah now we've all i know most of us in the industry have found that uh, that dashboard very interesting I've, i know i've used it a lot in previous webinars and, and ah. other words, so thanks thanks for that um does anyone have any more questions for us and as selena just commented that the worst of times has brought out to the most creativity in in people especially people in singapore Good comment, Selena. We're all we're all having to be a little bit uh, a bit creative at the moment. Yeah. And does, any, if, does anyone else have any more any more questions? I know we've gone a little bit over time, so I apologise for that. But we've had a lot to talk about. <laughs> Doesn't look like any more questions, people. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, if you have questions, you just feel free to reach out to Tim or I, and uh, you know, on LinkedIn or. There's our, there's our contact email. details. You can yeah. contact me, tim.russell at eroam.com and hannah at, hannah at peranderson.com. Um, yeah. We've also recorded this session, so we're gonna, I'm going to be putting that on uh, YouTube and on our website uh, probably later today or tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, eroam. We're doing another webinar next month in conjunction with the Mekong Tourism Organization. That'll be, I think, 23rd of February. We've got that one lined up for. And Hannah, you're doing a, a webinar this afternoon as well. Do you want to tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, so I've got a webinar at 3, so in a couple of hours, 3 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, and uh, it's with MG, and we're talking about what the current landscape is in, uh, in Southeast Asia in terms of tourism. Um, and I'll I be just registered it. for that one, so I'll be, oh, yeah. I'll be joining. <laughs> I'll be doing it with Gary Bowman, who I also co-host a podcast with the Southeast Asia Travel Show. Uh, so if you're also interested in uh, listening to podcasts and Southeast Asia tourism news, you should go check that out too. Excellent. Sounds good. Looking forward to that one. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Hannah, for joining us. Really appreciate your contribution. All right. Thanks, thanks, everybody, for attending and listening. And keep an eye out for future webinars from eRoam. I hope you all have uh, a successful year. I hope it's a successful year for all of you, more, more successful than last year. Let's hope. Keep our fingers okay. crossed. And uh, oh, we've got, a, we've got a comment here. Um, sorry, in the chat window. <laughs> thank you no, from Jermaine. No, no. Thanks, Jermaine. Oh, thank you. Yes, thanks, for Jermaine. Thanks for, thanks for <laughs> attending. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And look forward to speaking to you soon. See you guys. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.